How's it going, everyone, and welcome to the Bot Podcast, where we interview movers, shakers, and innovators, and talk all things conversational user interfaces. I'm your host, Chad Oda, and today we have a very special guest, Guy Kessels. Um, he's the co-founder and CEO of CurioBot. Now, CurioBot is an easy-to-use, intuitive, and dynamic chatbot builder for your website. Their platform also provides reporting and analytics, as well as integrations for popular messaging channels. Guy, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. It's great to have you. Um, so before we get started and roll into some chatbot specific questions, I always mm -hmm. like to ask our guests um, a rather unique question um, based on their background and experience. And um, I know you previously co-founded and raised money for your other startup, Hugo, um, yep. which is sort of an event management and promotion platform. Um, can you sort of tell me maybe a major obstacle that you had to overcome um, this sort of being your maybe first major startup that you had worked on? And then you mean the, 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 um, a major obstacle for, for Hugo and that's Right, right. Uh, I, I think for, for Hugo, because Hugo is indeed focused on, on festivals and events, uh, you know, us coming from the Netherlands, which is uh, sometimes seen as like event and festival heaven, uh, especially on the dance, uh, on, on the dance front. I think the major obstacle that we had to overcome uh, was was making sure that we that we got the right names in in terms of in terms of customers, um, especially in the beginning. You know, when you start with your first product and your first business, uh, we discovered that it was quite hard. You know, to to move our way through. You know, to get those customers uh, in. Lead times were very long. You know, and then when you when you get the first few, you know, then you get the idea. You know, that you're getting to a point. You know, when things when growth becomes a bit more autonomous um, but it certainly was not the case I mean the industry is very money driven and it really showed you know that we need to really be on top of the market like really the few really big names um, and that only after that you know we came into a phase where growth was becoming uh, uh, more sustainable so to speak so that was there was really a challenge, of course, you know, in terms of product product development. We also had to we had to build a lot, uh, but I think that yeah, the, the getting getting one of those big names in that was really a major a major thing. Yeah. No, yeah, I think that's great perspective, you know, for any real startup out here, right? Because it's always like once you start of get those you know big brand names, the tidal wave finally comes. But it's just like that time to get there. Sometimes it's just like excruciating. So absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And and I guess I mean there also the difference in, in industry types is is huge. Uh, I mean that the festival industry is a very very inspiring one. I would almost say you know there is a lot of innovations happening. There are a lot of phenomenal brand builders in there. Um, but it's also, as I said, it's it's very risky. Uh, it's very money driven, and to then maneuver your way through, uh, yeah, that proved to be a challenge. But uh, so far, so good. Cool. Yeah, glad to hear it. Well, it sounds like you definitely maneuvered your way through with um, with Hugo. Um, so maybe switching gears a little bit, um, why don't you tell me about CurioBot and what sort of the customer need and market opportunity that your company is addressing, and maybe some of the services that you guys offer. Yeah, yeah. So from Hugo, we we rolled into uh, the world of of chatbots, basically on customer demand. Uh, so a company from outside the the, the, the actual festivals wanted to uh, gain more insights and learn more from from festival goers. Uh, so there was a, a beer brand called Bavaria, and we wanted to make sure that we could service this company in a way that it uh, would lead to their result, but also that for consumers as such would be uh, a, a good and fun fun experience so so we came up with the first version at the time of CurioBot which compared to a lot of other uh, tools out there is a proactive chatbot uh, you know so it's not reactive waiting somewhere uh, but it addresses you uh, based on um, earlier displayed behavior and that can be uh, data that is coming from let's say a CRM tool uh, but that can also simply be just website behavior. And basically those two things, so with a good looking interface, uh, an integration with uh, existing tools uh, and a proactive attitude, so to speak, we, we went to market and we very quickly 
uh, uh, pulled in all kinds of other customers, also big brands actually, so that went much faster than, than with Hugo. Um, and what the use case is actually differs a lot per client. So uh, for some, it's the, the retrieval of feedback, but we've also got bots running that are calculating uh, premiums for insurances uh, that are navigating people through certain portals. Uh, so we've seen that, uh, especially with complex products uh, or, or difficult to understand you know, conditions that belong to a product, so with a mortgage or a pension or an insurance, you know, that CurioBot there flourishes. Um, so that was, you know, how we grown, you know, over the, over the past year. But what we saw is that that proactive attitude and that friendly uh, movement uh, was actually also very much appreciated by smaller and medium-sized enterprises. So what we did is to turn uh, to software as a service. And over the past few months, we've... Uh, extended the platform largely, um, tested it a lot, um, so that people can build these kind of curio bots themselves. Um, again, with the proactive philosophy and also all kinds of ways to integrate it with uh, with other systems and to keep the entrance barrier low, so low uh, starting price, uh, etc. Cool. No, I, I think that's really cool because I think you're right. A lot of these bots out here, it's sort of reactive bots and it's just like you know we're sort of waiting for something to happen whereas your bot you know right when i go to some of your uh, demo websites and even your your primary website you know i'm the bot is sort of reaching out to me asking me you know several different questions that i may have provided the products or services you know so i think that's a really cool touch you know i'm hoping to see a lot more chatbot platforms or chatbot you know um, builders begin driving in that direction yeah, I mean, of course, you have to be careful that you that you as or that your bot, you know, does not become intrusive, you know, especially on mobile devices or a small screen. You know, you 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 need to make sure that it behaves in a way that it fits uh, your 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 website visitors. But we we approached it in kind of the same way as as in a store. You know, if 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 you're walking somewhere, you have no idea what jeans to pick, and then isn't it much nicer if somebody walks up to you and then is of service instead of you walking to a counter? And that simple principle uh, we see happening a lot. I mean, just a, a website as such is, of course, static and waiting for a user to do something, uh, which in our philosophy is one of the reasons why, you know, simple forms are not converting anymore. So with a tool like CurioBot, you know, start first changing these forms, uh, make sure that you don't do it in, in too much of an intrusive way, get some learnings from how people interact, you know, from there on out, gradually move into uh, the, the real world, the big world of chatbot. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I think it's really interesting, like how you guys sort of maybe had a more natural segue to bots, you know, with your initial use case and in startup being Hugo, and then some of the big brands were asking you guys, if I remember correctly, you know, they wanted to figure out how to track, you know, engagement with their brand, you know, following, uh, I think some sponsorship at these events. And that mm -hmm. was sort of the initial use case that you guys saw. And I think you guys, you know, sort of immediately began seeing a lot of engagement, um, which I think is really cool because I think, you know, real primary use cases right now in the chatbot space that seem to be, you know, successful or turning ROI are, you know, one sort of the advertising and sort of feedback use case. And then the other one is customer support. Um, mm -hmm. So do, can you sort of maybe go into that initial use case a bit more? Because I think it might be interesting uh, for the user base to sort of look at your use case, because I think it's a bit more unique than a lot of the advertising bots on Facebook right now. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. So uh, the story was as follows. So in the south of the Netherlands, uh, there were a few festivals that we already worked together with, with the Hugo product, and that were all uh, having a sponsorship agreement with a beer brand called Bavaria. And anybody from the Netherlands or this part of Europe probably probably knows knows the brand and their clear focus, you know, on 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 on, on the, 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 the like the ecosystem demographically around them, sort of geographically around them, so to speak. Anyhow, um, they wanted to gain uh, some more insights in to what extent their brand activations and their sponsorships actually led to people buying beer in the weeks after that festival. And with that question, it came to us because we were already working with these festivals and already uh, working on their, their, their profile enrichments, you know, data management, surveys, etc. 
but we couldn't serve Bavaria with the Hugo product. Uh, you know, first of all, it's for these festival organizers. You know, they are working with it. They are collecting that data. Um, so it's not for us to use. And next to that, you have to, in this case, to answer this question, you have to make sure that you touch base with people, you know, at multiple points in time, you know, possibly via different channels. You know, there are quite some questions that you need to get answered from them. So then we decided, all right, you know, if people go to festivals, then they talk about it afterwards with each other. They might share some feedback, sometimes relevant, sometimes not, but they also talk about all kinds of other things. So why not develop a, and there we come again, proactive bot uh, that basically drops by these folks and tries to become part of those conversations, you know, when it concerns an after movie, uh, how much fun people had, the sharing of pictures, et cetera. And that basically addresses them like, hey, you know, how, how was it? Uh, and the next time, uh, did you have a beer uh, by now, by any chance? And if the answer is yes, you know, what beer was it then, et cetera. And then by doing that, you can take these bits and pieces of the information that, that those people then provide and turn it into a dashboard with the applicable KPIs for that, that, that beer brand. And that's how we basically from, you know, event management, email campaigning, surveys, and a specific festival tool, moved into uh, chatbots because when we first talked to Bavaria, we had nothing more than, than, than a, a simple working prototype that just looked very cool. Um, but from there on out, you know, things, things progressed quite, quite quickly. And it was indeed actually a natural move for us to start moving further in that direction and see what other companies and brands would uh, appreciate that similar philosophy as we uh, yeah, pitched it at, at Bavaria because they very quickly said yes. And from there on out, you know, we started moving and, and growing. Then it turned out that the use cases that companies are often thinking of differ greatly. And also that it's not really clear, especially within these big corporates, whose uh, responsibility uh, to work with the bot, <laughs> because it goes from e-commerce to brand to customer services, etc. cetera. Um, but because we had such a clear defined uh, mission that we could already show at that point in time, uh, we were able to to go through and start, you know, lining up these these kind of things with those other brands as well. And then the new ca cases, of course, you know, came came from there. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, that's really interesting. Uh, can you maybe like talk about like what sort of a campaign would look like using your your curio bot? I'm just trying to think about, you know, because my background is marketing, um, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm thinking about, you know that uh, beer campaign you're talking to. So I'm assuming they already had some sort of, you know, emails or some sort of way to authenticate those end users. I don't know if it's a Facebook sign up or something. Yeah, then, that's a good thing about those festivals because festivals as such, you know, I don't know whether you go to e music events or festivals, you know, they know a lot about the people that show up. And uh, I mean, they, they, they collect and they are the owner, right? So they collect uh, the, 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 the data from people that, for example, purchase tickets. I mean, here in the Netherlands, most of these festivals work with white label ticketing companies. So the, the event company becomes the owner of the personal data of people that buy the tickets. So they have ways of reaching them. And that can, of course, indeed be uh, via email, uh, but maybe even a text message with a, a link to, for example, a curio bot. And then based on uh, uh, the data that is already there, for example, that purchasing data, you already know some things that you then don't have to ask. And so uh, with, let's say, one of these festivals was really uh, making sure that they could uh, email people uh, um, and also keep track of you know, who opened, who clicked, et cetera, so that new reminder campaigns could, could go. There were also uh, festivals that said, now, you know, we want to just run it social or via social uh, channels, you know, like Facebook uh, or, or Twitter even. Um, you know, and then from there on out, they started pinpointing uh, their, their target groups, getting these messages out uh, with ways to uh, let their audience engage with, with CurioBot. And from there, the findings could be collected. So we were in the luxury position, or we are in the luxury position that those festivals have indeed contact data. If you don't have that from people, of course, then the whole campaign would, would not have run. Um, but yeah, that's the advantage in that regard, of the, the white label approach that uh, most of these festivals have taken here in the Netherlands. No, that's, uh, I think that's really cool that uh, a lot of your customer base actually has like the initial insights um, before they actually go ahead and leverage that for these campaigns. True. Um, yep. 
So um, can you talk about maybe some of the other initial successes that you guys saw, maybe use cases outside of the, the festival scene uh, that were sort of really encouraging to you guys? Because, you know, I think there, there must have been some sort of like transition for you guys when it's just like, you know, we're using this with our Hugo customers and we're seeing it work very well with events. And then, you know, at a certain point, it was like, well, we can use this for a lot of other use cases too. And then you guys begin seeing these unique use cases outside of festivals and, you yep. know, the clients, you know, getting a lot of ROI or value out of them. Yeah. Yeah. I think, but, but that's maybe if you would ask one of the tech guys or one of the other founders, uh, they, they would answer that question differently. But for me, it was really something like, wow, you know, we're really onto something here was when we started working for uh, a company that does uh, funeral insurances here in the Netherlands. Oh, so, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's not the, the most light topic to, to talk about, but um, they, uh, so, so basically what, what happens, and it's the case in the Netherlands, I'm, I'm, it must be pretty much everywhere else in the world, I guess, but uh, there is with insurance, like premiums, there is a, a correction for, the inflation as it takes place, right? Mm. So, uh, you know, I, I want to be insured for in case I, I, I pass away that I am covered or that my family is covered for funeral costs, which can be very high. So I'm paying X euro per month. And then once a year, there is an indexing process that takes place in which your premium fee is corrected, you know, based on the inflation as it has taken place in the country. Now, I already realized that when I'm explaining this, you know, John Doe has no idea what that means, which I can imagine. I mean, also extremely well-educated people that work in this field of work, you know, uh, or in this expertise often have difficulty understanding it. So um, this funeral insurance company saw that because you don't really have a lot of content to share as a funeral insurance, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that as soon as they would reach out to their um, customers, uh, that that would be a point in time in which people all of a sudden start realizing like, hey, you know, what am I actually paying to these guys? Oh, this, my monthly fee goes up, you know, can I cancel? You know, where do I cancel? I'm, I'm trying to, to, I will see what, what, what price I have to pay at the neighbors. While it's a normal thing, it happens with everybody. So what they needed was a tool, and they turned to us for that, that would help them uh, guide these people through these kind of processes that would help their customers understand why things happen as they happen. And that it's not, you know, just a way of making money, but that is a, a, a principle that needs to be applied to economically. So what we what we uh, partnered up and what we did was basically, you know, people would be invited you know, via email or so to log into their portal where their, their, like their conditions and, and, and premiums and such were, were shown and where there was a curio bot ready that would a personally welcome them, you know, with messages based on things we already knew, recent changes, maybe contact that they've had with customer and uh, customer services, you know, that you can move forward with, and uh, people would basically be taken by the hand through, you know, the changes that were upcoming. In case something was unclear, the bot would explain. In case they immediately wanted to alter things, let's say uh, turn from a, a monthly payment to a quarterly one. They could immediately do so. The bot would then update the portal as such in the background so that they could see, you know, is this now correct? Yes, I want to also add this family member to the insurance policy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, and at the end, of course, the famous question, you know, whether they were helped uh, correctly. And the figures, you know, that we got from it and the responses from people on, on how they, they did it, and the amount of new people that were subscribed in, instead of people leaving, yeah, that was terrific. <laughs> that was that was for me and you know that was a really big eye opener say you know that that would that, that was really yeah yeah we're on to something here you know this is really this is if we can pull this off then i'm very curious what we can do with all kinds of others so with that you know we could of course move again but what was also happening and that's the the the, the, the cool part i guess you know where we're in right now is that we of course had a lot of people that saw this you know i want to have this as well and that was the medium and small size one so we decided to start betting on two horses and not only that, that, that those big projects for corporates, but also the, the software as a service, which will become available uh, starting at, at 20 euro a month um, uh, and, and try and do, try and do both. So yeah, that's where we are right now. And now hopefully with, with the, the SaaS platform, with the, the CurioBot control room, we will have something that will provide us with equal uh, 
uh, cool findings and a new enthusiasm to to make it fly from there on out. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's an awesome use case. You know, because I think we're beginning to see a lot of insurance companies and you know banks adopt these type of chatbots. You know, and uh, I'm sure you've seen the uh, Lemonade chatbot, which sold over a hundred thousand policies. You know, yeah. so there is a considerable amount of potential for chatbots in those spaces. Um, I'm curious. Yeah, definitely with those, definitely with those 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 difficult products. I mean, if I mm-hmm. have to look myself, yeah, I also have all kinds of insurances running. But do I really know what I'm actually insured for? You know, in case something happens. I mean, the answer is no, and that I think goes for every human being. Uh, yeah, and that is yeah, there are tremendous chances uh, there. So yeah, excited for things to come. No, I absolutely agree with you. Um, yeah, I have no idea what's what's probably in my insurance as well. So, you know, hopefully they get an insurance bot from, from CurioBot soon. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I, I'm curious, just like from like a UX perspective in that one, you know, funeral insurance chat bot, um, was it like really heavy on NLP or was it more like button driven or was it like a combination of both or? Uh, no, no, it was not heavy on, on NLP at all, actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, main main reason for that being that uh, uh, if if for people the subject as such is already difficult to comprehend, then getting input from them about a particular subject will be even more trickier to 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 deal with. So we made sure that especially in the, in the first part of the conversation uh, um, that you know people would basically just have to to click, you know, guide their way through, uh, see what, what makes sense, what's logical, um, especially also uh, because um, when it, for example, con- concerned the, 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 the funeral insurance, it's not a portal that people are on on a daily basis, you know, and in, in the time between the last time of logging in and, and now probably also a lot has changed. So the more stimuli would go into their face, the more confusing things would get about a product that is already difficult to comprehend. So in that regard, it was not NLP heavy heavy at all. And what we actually see now also with the SaaS platform um, is that people uh, stay stay away from it. <laughs> they, they just configure things that are easy to, to go. Um, simple, you know, contact forms, feedback forms, uh, registration forms, uh, all of that stuff. Uh, remove those first, see what happens there, and then... Um, uh, when when putting a curio bot in there, and then from there on out, go into you know the more the more sophisticated stuff. But let's, let's put yeah, you know that's that's actually fairly representative of you know several people that I've talked to and bot implementations we've worked on uh, internally here. You know, it seems to me like you know for conversion based activities where you're sort of driving them to some sort of end state, NLP just is not robust enough right now. Um, I mean, you could certainly try and do it, but like to try and address you know, the multitude of edge cases and different types of rhetoric people use uh, is, is really a scalability issue. You know, so yeah. I do see a lot of people using button driven or restricting text, which seems to be very, very successful because when we are seeing case studies, so I was actually talking to a friend of mine, um, Ari, uh, he works at this uh, marketing agency in Chicago called BAMF. Um, or I want to say, wait, not in Chicago and California, but I digress. Um, so he just released this case study where they turned over $200,000 for a Kickstarter fund and the chatbot's entirely button driven, you know? So I I think it's really interesting to look at the underlying trends right now. I know a lot of people have hyped up NLP, but I think it's Mm -hmm. maybe best suited for customer service type of interactions potentially. Um, Yeah. And also maybe, uh, uh, or at least that's, 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 that's our, uh, or my humble experience is that, it's it's also not affordable just yet for a lot of lot of companies. So you also, I mean, for us as a as a business that's 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 in there, you know, we we really need to look at okay, you know, there could be some very cool things possible for a specific client with you know either a specific use case or uh, with the budget available, you know, to make you know something really big. Um, but there is indeed a hype uh, going on. You know, we're also, you know, one of the few, you know, in, in, in this war zone uh, concerning uh, chatbots. So it, I think that also very quickly becomes a case of a right. So where are the opportunities here? And our philosophy is that on that topic, there are tons of opportunities. Um, but uh, if small and medium-sized enterprises also want to start moving or marketing agencies that need to come up with something 
new or cool, you know, for your website of a client, um, yeah, then you need to start looking at some other things uh, first uh, until the whole NLP hype uh, in that regard really takes shape and provides every kind of company of all sizes, also the ones with limited budget, uh, with the right results. You know, and we're not there yet. I don't know whether you agree, but uh, there are still some improvements to be made. Yeah, you know, I totally agree with your sentiment. I think definitely a lot of the NLP was overhyped. Um, I mean, I think you can do a certain considerable amount of things with platforms right now, but I think, uh, you know, there's just a lack of conversational data sometimes to train these models in addition to, you know, just a scalability issue. And even compounding that issue is the fact that, you know, a lot of these roles and, and positions within companies for chatbots and voice just don't even exist yet. You know, it's <laughs> like, I, I can't go out and hire like a UX guy that specializes in chatbots and voice because, you know, it's really only been around for about a year and a half to two years. When you think about the incumbent platforms like Microsoft, Lewis and Dialogflow that have been around um, for a very short time now. Um, so I completely, I completely agree with you. And I think, you know, being successful in this space right now is more about operating within the limitations of current platforms and sort of making sure you align them to use cases where those things will be sort of fruitful. And I think right now that is difficult for a lot of people jumping into chatbots and even especially voice to a greater extent. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of unknowns. Um, so maybe using that as a segue, you know, just seeing how new chatbots are for everyone and we're all sort of trying to explore and identify great insights and best practices. Um, can you maybe talk to maybe a couple of, or an initial obstacle that you guys face sort of building CurioBot out? Um, because I think we're all sort of new to the space and we're trying to discover, you know, how to best do things or develop things or build things. Mm -hmm. Well, on, on, on the tech side of things, you would really have to ask uh, Anatoly or Sitsin and the other two, other two co-founders. Um, one of the obstacles, because I, I cannot develop anything, unfortunately. Um, yeah, I can't either, so I'm the, in the same boat. <laughs> nice. Um, uh, no, one of the, the, the major obstacles, I think, for, for, for CurioBot when we, when we got into the space was, was defining uh, the, 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 the market fit. You know, on some way, we needed to uh, not really shake off the things that we did for, for festivals. We needed to find a, a way in which we could utilize it, the knowledge and, and, and ex experience that we got from there, and turn that into something that uh, uh, with a, a chatbot product would, would fit the need of, of companies. Um, because I, I think that so, that, so that's one thing. And the second is, is finding who's actually responsible for the whole lot because there are tons of tools that are currently already being embraced by companies and that in the eyes of some people is a chat functionality, chat bot, but actually it's just live chat, you know, it requires an agent, so it's something completely different. And uh, we need to uh, show that we are doing something completely different, um, but very often also leads to better results, um, but which we could only bring forward if the story would be right, you know, and if it would actually fit uh, the, the, the the need that they were looking for, and that that was that was tricky, especially because of the of the ongoing hype, and it will probably remain tricky throughout the upcoming years, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. I think you know, attaining product market fit for a new startup is always sort of tricky, and you know that's even more compounded in you know startups where there's emerging technology. So you know, I, I definitely agree and understand with that sentiment. Um, by the way, if you're hearing any beeping noise, I got to apologize because they're, they're doing some sort of construction outside my apartment right now. So uh, no worries. Hopefully it's not too bad, right? For me, it's perfectly fine. <laughs> if uh, any of the listeners also don't mind, then, then it's completely good. <laughs> okay, perfect. Yeah, I just didn't know how loud it was, it was ending up on your side. Oh, no, it's fine. Okay, cool. Um, so, you know, just in, in regards to your company specific vision, you know, what, what, what do you see like your company, like, you know, at the end of the day, you know, what are you guys looking to achieve or like maybe what's like an exit goal for you guys at this point? Right. So, um, currently, uh, we, we have placed our, 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 a few of our bigger bets on, on the software as a service platform. Uh, because of you know findings and learnings that we've taken over the past couple couple months, you know the the, the needs you know that we think we we see, um, and the philosophy there, or at least you know the steps towards the future, is first you know get 
uh, a decent amount of users on board that just you know dip their toe in the cold water you know all of them have a website even if you're just the local or just even if you're the local baker or the the local notary or real estate agent doesn't really matter and you have contact forms you have feedback forms your registration stuff use curiobot to replace those first do it on your website because there are people have an alternative um so your website visitors have an alternative sure you can use social channels or whatsoever but then people are funneled so use that one first and I, that that is really the thing that where we are in right now where you can connect or you can forward people and it yes but you know take that as a, as a first step now when time progresses we believe if we've done it right and also if we've managed to gather enough users on the platform the new technologies will become uh, more available you know they will they will optimize they will grow and so will the need of all of these users that are then already on the platform. So when it comes to natural language processing, machine learning, deep learning, artificial intelligence, um, these kind of things we absolutely believe in, but they are not accessible for the mass, you know, for that two person real estate company just yet. Um, so that is something that we see, or that we think we will see slowly progress, you know, over the upcoming years. And those are then technologies that we want to make available to the mass of users that by that time are hopefully already on the on the platform. Um, from there on out, it basically, yeah, <laughs> then we get to a point uh, where we can, of course, you know, turn to other channels, uh, turn to voice, turn to all these all these kind of things. Um, but then we're really further further down the road. Um, so when it concerns uh, exit exit strategies, there are multiple opportunities. You know, if we get to that stage, uh, you know that 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 can concern uh, uh, multiple types of, of of companies. So to be very honest, um, is there a, an exit strategy between now and five years completely set in stone already with dots on the horizon? Uh, no, we're actually too excited for you know, the first first uh, upcoming year to uh, to tackle and see how things grow from there because we do think that it's you know if you if we would succeed we will no but uh, when we succeed to to get a lot of uh, users on the platform then it of course also still remains to be seen you know where the the technology as such in which direction it, it will develop i mean in the United States, you know, people have multiple Alexas, uh, uh, Echoes, etc. You know, here in Europe, things are just getting started. Like here in the Netherlands, you know, the Dutch language, I'm not sure whether it's it's properly supported already. It's there, and you have a few chatbot guides that are already specifically focusing on it. It's all, you know, in the starting point, you know, we're a few years behind. Um, yeah, and that's, well, we will have to see how those things uh, progress. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. To your point, you know, that's actually really interesting because I heard Google was finally officially announcing they're going to be supporting Dutch. I think it was this. Yeah. And the other interesting thing, too, is, you know, I know that you say you guys are, you know, a little behind the curve, but something I've been noticing, and I've actually mentioned this to a couple of people from the Netherlands as well that are also working on chatbots and voice, is that I, I swear there's a ton of people in the Netherlands and, in, and uh, that, that are either owning agency companies or building products. I don't know if this is a trend that you're seeing. Um, it, it just seems to me there's a ton of people in the Netherlands right now working on these type of uh, products. Uh, and then specifically in, in the world of chatbots and such. Uh, yeah, you, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I guess when you grow up in it, you know, then it, it, then it doesn't really show. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but um, yeah, yeah, maybe you're right. Um, I mean, I've heard maybe on the contrary that there are quite some, maybe that's where it's coming from, that um, uh, the Netherlands is very often used by, by bigger corporates as sort of like the testing ground, you know, mm -hmm. like kind of the playground. You know, it's a small market, uh, relatively specific language. You know, um, if, 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 if they appreciate it, you know, then, then other non-English speaking countries also do. Maybe that's where it's slightly is coming from and that therefore, you know, some of the development in the in the in the chatbot direction are taking place. But if you would ask me for a uh, for reason why or anything along, <laughs> I, I would honestly I wouldn't know. I honestly wouldn't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, that that's it's just something interesting I, I begin to notice. Um 
but switching gears a little bit, um, you know, since you've been in the chatbot space for a little bit at this point, and I'm sure you've tried out a tremendous number of different bots um, or even voice bots for that matter. Um, have you used like any bot recently um, that you thought was actually a really, really great experience or are you still sort of in the ballpark of, you know, uh, chatbots have a ways to go yet before I'm sort of satisfied or my expectations are met? Yeah, it's, it's the latter. It's the latter, it's yeah. especially because it, it, it's very often obvious, you know, when there's a human takeover. And that is sort of the, the moment for me, at least, where I, where I feel like it's game over. Um, but I'm also, I'm, I'm also in that regard, you know, of course, uh, a bit, bit, bit ruined already. Like you look at it with a, with a, with a different kind, kind of view. Yeah. Um, there are, of course, uh, there have been a few ones in which it's in which the reply is like, yeah, well, this is actually quite quite cool, but then then it's 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 either a very specific use case, um, you know, the ones that 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 try and be everything, yeah, those I haven't I've haven't been really really excited about, but I also have to I also have to admit that the amount of other bots that I've been looking at is relatively small. Um, I, 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 or we try and identify things, uh, of course, also by looking at, 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 at competition, uh, but more looking at clients. So in every kind of sales talk that I've had, you know, where we didn't get in, because there are also numerous, numerous of those, um, we try and, and, and get the insights on, okay, so why not? You know, where, 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 was, where, where was the fit not uh, there? Um, and that is basically what we use as findings to, to progress with, with the business and, and with, with the product as such. Yeah, no, that's, that's actually very interesting. Um, a couple points from that. Um, you know, I think one, you know, I think maybe you and I probably aren't the demographics for a lot of these bots or the specific <laughs> persona, right? So maybe that's why our expectations are a little out of whack, but it's also probably because, um, you know, we were promised on like this, uh, on this sort of idealistic, vision of a chatbot and voice that maybe we're a little bit disillusioned uh, from from seeing what actually exists these days and uh, you know finally you know to your point about hearing why companies you know didn't you know um, work with you guys for whatever reason you know I'm curious you know from like a you know uh, company stakeholder perspective uh, perspective you know what were like some of the reasons or what do you see like these enterprise companies actually looking for when they're looking for like a chatbot partner or a voice partner, because I think it, it's relatively new for them as well. Yeah, well, that, that's 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 very often. Uh, so 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 compliance is often one. Um, you know, they've they've got certain rules in place regarding data security, uh, regarding uh, data storage, uh, all of these things. Not that we don't want to fit their bill. I mean, we can we can build it exactly up to their requirements. You know, that's, yeah. uh, that's out of the question. But if there are already companies that are, let's say, a preferred supplier or that have already passed the, 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 the mill of paperwork, so to speak, uh, yeah, then, then you don't stand a chance. You know, then you can almost give everything away for free and work for a year for free. But even that is not, you know, the incentive to move forward. So I think one of the biggest reasons is basically, you know, old structures already being in place. Um, we actually have had some corporates that basically said, yeah, okay, so we <laughs> we we already have the, the preferred supply agreements in place. But we really want to work with you guys, so we're just going to pretend like you are invoicing uh, our preferred supplier. They will then pay you, and we will invoice that preferred supplier. And then via that, you know, we make the circle round again, so we can still uh, get things going with you guys. That that has already happened in our short short lifetime. So that's. That's, I think, the biggest reason. The second one um, is that they have already uh, systems in place, let's say a live chat a tool that has been developed for them custom uh, that they want to uh, keep using and for which, you know, we then, of course, need to dedicate resources to make sure that we've got CurioBot uh, uh, connected uh, with an API to, to that live chat environment which does not support anything just yet or because of which the enterprise company needs to pay our invoice for the bot and also another invoice for the live chat supplier um, to uh, make those two talk. 
you know, and then it, it's it's very often more politics uh, than 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 anything else, or uh, yeah, systems that are that are already in in place. So also that became part of the ways of approaching these bigger companies and try and identify w when having those talks with them to not go for these massive kind of uh, projects where all kinds of integrations are required. Compliance needs to have a look at it, and somebody from legal and the IT department, and of course, you know, the marketeers themselves and customer service, but to try and identify you know, this one specific use case um, so we could, you know, maneuver our way through their existing systems and, 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 and protocols, get it signed off from there, and then grow. Because that's, I guess, one of the most important learnings, you know, that, that, that I have taken from, from working in, uh, or having your startup is that it's much easier to sell something at a place where you've already sold something before. Um, but money does need to roll. If you give it away for free, then you can forget it. So, um, yeah, that's how we maneuvered and, and, and uh, yeah, in between with these corporates. But again, we've used, we've tried to use the same low entrance barrier for the software as a service platform. Because if you combine or if you compare, for example, let's say ChatFuel or, or CurioBot, then CurioBot is much, much simpler, uh, I think, for, for, for you know, a common mortal, you know, to understand, you know, simple drag and drop and, and, and move it from there. But we think that with that, you enable yourselves to generate a larger mass. And if you have a larger mass, you can make new technologies available quicker because you've already taken the learnings on what they appreciate and what technology they actually need, you know, and from there you proceed onward. Yeah, no, absolutely. I actually echo those, both of those sentiments, um, you know, because us working with enterprise companies, we've sort of seen similar things, you know, from a compliance standpoint, um, you know, out here in the United States with HIPAA, for healthcare medical records. And, you know, when you look at sort of the pre-existing platforms that exist, not a lot of them are HIPAA compliant, you know, that's so that sort of seems to be an obstacle that, you know, a lot of these solutions need to get around and, and really address, you know? Um, so I definitely see that as a, a big obstacle. And, you know, secondly, to your point, I do agree there, there is quite a lot of politics in this space, right? Whether it's from pre-existing vendors that have live chat and you know the client is coming to you and, and saying hey can you integrate with these guys and then you get on the phone with them and they have their own platform and now they don't want to yeah. release api documentation <laughs> and then now you got to find an expert and now it's just like okay are we sort of like spinning cycles here and yeah. it, is it worth it right so yeah. you know and not only that but you know it's it's also internal too it's um i think you actually pointed this out it's like which company stakeholders own what and do they actually have enough context to be effective in making these internal decisions um, in a way that's going to yield some sort of you know um, metrics that show success and you know i think that a lot of times is a little hazy too you know it's like they see this new technology they know that it can be very beneficial but a lot of times I'm not exactly sure they're clear on what metrics they're looking to get out of these things. So a lot of politics, but you know, it sounds like you're certainly learning a lot. We've certainly learned a lot in the same regard. So, you know, it, it's sort of good to hear some validation, you know, in regards to sales prospecting in regards to chatbots and enterprise customers. So I always find that fascinating. Yeah. And well, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's not uncommon to have at least uh, seven, eight, nine people at the table who uh, who want to have a saying in, in let's say, a chatbot project. Um, not that there's something wrong with that, because we, once we're in, can take learnings from all these kind of stakeholders with everybody's completely different, different expertise. But that makes the lead times indeed much longer. And for the ones that are actually pulling the card that they have to make the decision, uh, let, let's say the level above those those eight eight nine people, you know, for them it almost becomes frustrating because there are all kinds of different metrics in place that everybody uh, is actually looking for. So again, that's why we at least try and take an approach and let's take one use case, please, where it's clearly definable what metrics, who the stakeholders are, you know, who can we shift gears with, um, who defines and how do we define uh, when it can be considered a success. And how do you also make sure that there are cutoff uh, points? 
because I think also over the past couple of years, especially those big enterprises slash corporates have seen uh, projects and that will go, go wrong or cost way much than it actually delivers. Yeah, and now there's a new development uh, from startups that have a short or relatively short track record of one and a half years, which is nothing. So yeah, why shouldn't we actually stick to these guys of who we know that they deliver and yeah, maybe it's a, uh, not as cool or not as fancy but you know it's a safe bet so for now you know it, it's not broken so let's not fix so let's not fix it that that kind of attitude um but on the other hand that's also what makes it exciting i think right exactly i, I think it's uh challenges and also at the same time our our uh, own opportunities as well that uh, are at stake so you're right True. it's always uh, yeah. it's always uh sort of entertaining and fascinating and scary and encouraging all at the same time no, and I'm also very curious to what extent, you know, companies, us, but also people who are doing the same thing somewhere else or are slightly different, will be able to cross borders with it. And to what extent, you know, the language barriers will now really take 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 place. I mean, uh, we as a small Dutch company are in general, you know, excited if we could do something, you know, in, in, in the United States as such, because the market the possibilities, you know, and as of all the all the, 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 the cool startup stories, you know, that, 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 that come across the pond into, into Europe. But I'm very curious whether, you know, there will actually be possibilities for it if you don't have a software as a service uh, platform and how that will develop, you know, the guys like us who, who, who have a product focus versus the guys who are more on like project uh, focus, so to speak. I'm very curious how that's going to develop in the land of politics and language and involving technologies and that. Uh, it's definitely an exciting time to be alive. No, yeah, absolutely. You know, and I think we're, we're probably, uh, you know, maybe addressing your point right now. You know, um, I've been reaching out to people in the Netherlands. You know, I'm sure you've been reaching out to a lot of people in the U.S. and elsewhere around the world. You know, I've talked to people from Belgium, Singapore, Australia, U.K. Like, you know, um, there's a country out there, you know, they're working on chatbots somewhere. You know, so I, I think it's, it's actually really interesting. And you're right, you know, to see where this all culminates, right, to see what sort of cross- country collaborations, um, especially since, you know, now we're seeing NLP for a number of uh, additionally supported languages, um, including Dutch now. So I absolutely look forward to seeing how things sort of uh, evolve here. Yeah, so, definitely. Uh, speaking of, um, you know, maybe going back to my last point of, of also talking about some of the challenges, um, in your opinion, you know, sort of at a high level with chatbots, what are some of like the obstacles um, that currently exists, whether in the market or from a UX side or from a technology side that you feel need to really be addressed in order for us to get to this like next level of chatbot experience? Whoa. Uh, I think it's a combination. I think it's a combination of things to, uh, of course, technological uh, uh, progression is, is one of them. Support for different kinds of languages, of course, you know, the obvious. Um, the 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 restructuring of uh, how chatbots are being dealt with, you know, within within companies, um, and I think also, but that is something, you know, it's a bit, how do you call it, like preaching for your own church, like it's, uh, I, I I think still quite some entrance barriers need to be need to be lowered before things really take off. Um, over the past months, years, you know, we've had our numerous conversations with with the small and medium-sized business owners and also with just like you mentioned it already marketing agencies and i think they need to embrace uh, uh chatbots uh, not a chatbot builder that does something really cool with a big brand like mcdonald's or, or, or starbucks because you know that's what the, that's the, the front line of the innovation so to speak but it needs to be, you know, a few levels below that before, you know, you can scale it up, you know, as a, as a whole. And I guess, you know, uh, you could maybe draw a comparison a bit. I don't know whether people start shooting in, in the comments now, but uh, okay. maybe with, with like apps, you know, that, yeah. that was first something, you know, only for the, 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 the really big guys, you know, from there on out, it became smaller and, and smaller. Uh, or it became more and more and more accessible. I guess with chatbots, you know, we're, we're moving in kind of the same direction where we're now still somewhere high up where you have guys like us with 
numerous ones probably all over the world who are trying to bring down that 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 barrier, making it making it more accessible. And I think you know only when it when it's lowered, um, that then you 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 can actually see you know the the the, the whole thing gradually advancing. Let's put it like that. No, yeah, I think I think you're right. I think that's a spot on comparison. You know, I think you know people wait around in the market until they see you know some sort of validation as far as a technology yielding consistent ROI, you know, and I think mm. that's what we're all sort of waiting for here. And I think yeah. or that the validation is even just as simple as he's doing it, then I should do it. Right. Just as simple as that. But it hasn't gotten to that point because he is also still not yet able to to access it, so to speak. So uh, I think that's yeah the, the validation, you know, either seeing all right, so there I read they have a top ROI, then we should be able to to at least get the same, but then it's clear, you know, what the metrics are, you know, as you, as you mentioned it before, or they have it and I don't want to miss out, you know, the good old FOMO being in place. Right, so, right. but then the same kind of validation is there and as well, because Hey, if, if they're doing it, then we should do too. Yep. I, I think an interesting thing, you know, that's maybe different this time around, you know, with mobile apps for a very long time, it was like, if you're not a mobile developer, you can't make an app. Right. And I think that's how it was for a long time. But, you know, I think as technology matures, you get complexity abstracted out of it. You know, we see it with websites with like WordPress and you know Squarespace. We see the same thing with um, with mobile now. I, I've seen like mobile app builders. But it's interesting with chatbots. It started it sort of started there. You know, almost it was like from the get go. We had these drag and drop graphical user interfaces that we can create chatbots. So even marketers and, and business consultants could make them. Um, so I, I think it's almost like in some respects, you know, in comparison to mobile, um, chatbots were more advanced, but at the same time, I think they also track sort of the market adoption of mobile as well in the sense that when mobile started, everyone needed an app, right? For whatever reason, didn't matter about the ROI. It's just like we needed an app, right? So it sort of speaks to your, you know, fear of missing out. Mm -hmm. um, sort of mindset, right? And I, I think that's what we're sort of seeing now with chatbots. But then we sort of wait and see where the ROI use cases come. You know, as mobile apps did, they became more mature. And then you see really effective and really successful startups like Uber. And I think that's the same trajectory we will hopefully see with chatbots. But I think there's an even greater obstacle with chatbots. And that is just the fact that user experience from a conversational aspect is is fairly untouched um and i think a lot of work needs to go into that um that that sort of area uh, of expertise um mm. in comparison yeah. to, to mobile apps maybe a little bit where there's a focus on graphical user interfaces yeah, no I, I i fully fully agree i mean maybe to to come back on those points so so yes you know that's where absolutely a, a big part of the focus must must lie in order to 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 make you know the industry as as such grow and, and more successful. And regarding the adaptation, uh, I, I think I also agree, you know, with the fact that, or with, with what you mentioned, that that, that with chatbots, it, it goes quicker. Uh, it, it maybe could even be explained uh, due to the fact that that the, the, the devices are now already there. I mean, when we first started with smartphones uh, and, and, and accompanied, you know, apps, not everybody uh, embraced the, 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 the smartphone as a device just yet. Uh, while now, you know, they kind of go hand in hand, the voice controlled speakers, etc. you know, that, that, that goes. And I guess that in, 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 in the online world or in, on the online side of things, uh, it, it kind of progresses also on, on the same speed with indeed the drag and drops. And it's already there. You know, you don't need to be able to code to, to, build, to build something. Uh, so maybe that is actually a heritage of, of apps that are now, that's now being put to good use. Yep. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I guess, I guess on this sort of same train of thought, you know, in regards to sort of trying to project what the future may be by looking at the past, um, you know, Guy, what is your vision of the future of chatbots, you know, in the next like five to 10 years or, or really whenever, you know, what does that sort of look like to you? Um, I think everything will eventually turn to voice. Straight away, I mean, it's just, it's simply more efficient and it's easier. So if I don't need to type, then I don't want to type. 
So, uh, I mean, also we, you know, Scurio Bot uh, are not focusing on, on voice just, just now, but I honestly think that it must uh, go there, uh, especially because of, you know, mobility. You know, you don't need anything with you to type on. You know, it's, 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 it's already there. It just needs to be recorded, but that appears to be <laughs> quite easy as well. So um, that is one thing. Uh, second is that I also do think that they will that there will remain discrepancies when it comes to comes to language. Uh, you know, English will go first. You know, just based on market market size. And I'm, yeah, on, on on that one, I'm very curious. You know, how that is going to develop because you can hear on my accent. You know, I'm not from the United States. Uh, if I try and control uh, echo uh, here. In English, uh, then it's very often still goes wrong, <laughs> and I'm very curious how that's going to uh, develop. So maybe uh, actually the ones that are able to 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 work with those kind of uh, current issues, also people with speech, uh, how do you call it, like disabilities, uh, and so yeah, yeah. maybe maybe they can actually be the big winners. But I, I do think you know that will, that will go to voice uh, eventually. Yeah, no, um, I, I totally agree with your sentiment. You know, I think voice is sort of the next hurdle we all have to get to. Um, my apologies again. It sounds like they're actually like cutting into the steel with a saw outside my oh, head. Oh, I, so. I honestly didn't hear anything. Okay, cool. I, I, I guess this, this microphone is paying off for me then. Um, yeah, it cool. is. Uh, Definitely. Yeah, I've been a little worried about it because there's so much ambient noise. But um, yeah, no, I agree. I think um, voice is very, very interesting and compelling. And I think a lot of the similar obstacles associated with chatbots, um, you know, also translate with voice, you know, but with voice, it's also like, you know, how do we find new skills and, you know, how do we, you know, identify revenue opportunities and, you know, so I think there'll be a lot of crossover. So a lot of the skills and insights we learned from chatbot development and platform development, um, I think will really aid um, as we transition to voice in the near future. So absolutely agree with your sentiment. Um, so maybe turning the turning the wheel back a little bit um, to current day here. Um, do you have any like best practices that you guys have seen work very well with your clients, or any insights that um, you like to share? Um, start. Uh, so yeah, maybe a few few things that immediately pop to mind is start with a very specific use case. Um, you know, start with with automating a in your eyes, maybe simple process, but do that first to take your first learnings. And then I'm really thinking, and then I'm really uh, meaning, you know, the, the the recreation of a feedback form into a chatbot, uh, the recreation of your current FAQ page into a chatbot. You know, these kind of relatively simple things start off with that first, and in, in, in my opinion, do it on a channel where people still have alternatives. Uh, on Facebook Messenger, you know, it's funneled. Start it on your website, and people can get the bot out of the way. You know, then there is still uh, uh, room for them to find what 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 they are looking for. Um, multilingual, uh, if possible, um, do it because people simply do feel appreciated. You know, if uh, a bot uh, uh, addresses them in in in, in their language, um, yeah, and also best practice, but that's I guess kind of an obvious one. Uh, don't do it, you know, just for the sake of it, because then there will be nothing to 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 gain. You know, if you start working with it, uh, with us or with anybody else, um, do it in a way and uh, that 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 shows you or that will provide you with learnings on how to actually improve a few things. Because having a conversation somewhere online um, and somebody is being helped or gives you five stars or so then at least you should have tracked, you know, why that actually was. And if somebody gives you permission to store it, uh, that it's actually being attached to somebody's uh, profile so you can use it to their benefit uh, in, in a later stage. Yeah, no, I think all great insights and tips. Um, you know, I, I think really whatever sort of insights or, or best practices the community can learn, you know, I think we'll begin to see a lot you know, more evolved bots in the next couple of years here. So appreciate those insights and tips. Um, so speaking of that, um, do you recommend to follow any people online or any books or any resources 
for people that are just getting into bot building or looking to sort of expand their knowledge? Yes, but I did forget the name of the of the of the writer. Uh, hang on, uh, the book title uh, at least it's it's called Ask, and uh, I'm quickly cheating a little bit by um, uh, opening Google just very quickly. But at oh, least totally fine. Can Take your time. Give give the right one. Yeah, found it right here. It's from Ryan Levesque, if I pronounce his last name correctly. Uh, and and the book is yeah Ryan Levesque and the the the, the title of the book is is asked um, the counterintuitive online formula to discover exactly what your customers want to buy create a mass of raving fans and take any business to the next level that is definitely something that I would uh, I would recommend everybody to uh, to read. Cool. No, absolutely. I'll have to, I'll have to check that out. Um, yeah. I'll forward you the link after the after Cool. The yeah, yeah, yeah. No, much, much appreciated. I'll make sure to put it in the description of, uh, of this podcast when I push oh, it. Oh, nice. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, cool. Cool. Well, um, before I let you go, um, I always ask all my viewers the same question, you know, because I think whether you're starting a startup or whether you're getting into, you know, a new technology where there's a lot of unknowns, um, tell me what keeps you motivated and inspired sort of on a day-to-day -day basis. What keeps you motivated and inspired on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, for me, and I think that also goes for the other guys, it's like these, these really small discoveries that you didn't see happening at all. So a few days ago, uh, we all of a sudden saw a, 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 a user putting a, a curio bot live on a governmental website in Saudi Arabia. You know, what are the chances? Where is that coming from? You know, that there were characters, you know, of, of Saudi Arabian language in, in that bot, you know, that we've never seen before. Terrific. You know, that can really put a smile on my face like that. So so how awesome is that, you know, that that, that me and, and, and the other guys are working on something that somebody on the other side of the world thought, hey, that's awesome. Let's give, let's give it a shot with these guys from the Netherlands have built. Yeah, that's... Inexplainable. That's, yeah, I think that's the coolest thing there is. Cool. No, I love it. Uh, Guy, appreciate your time so much being on the podcast, and we'll definitely have to have you come back uh, when you guys have some more announcements and uh, to see how your platform is going. So I definitely appreciate you being on the podcast today. Sounds, sounds good. In the future, let's do it again. Absolutely. Guy, thanks for being on. Very welcome.